Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Hope you're having a great Monday. I'm sure a lot of you are having a week of vacation like me. I hope wherever you are, you're safe and you're having lots of fun. We are going to do a crash course on the Chandler Halderson case this week. Last week, I took a little short trip up to Wisconsin to film a little something about this case that's going to air later this year. I will keep you posted on the details, but a lot of people had no clue about this case, and I actually covered this trial live last year, and it was intriguing. Before we jump in, music fact of the day, Go Your Own Way by Fleetwood Mac was written by Lindsay Buckingham, who wrote it as a breakup message directed to the one and only Stevie Nicks. I remember this case when it first hit the news that they were looking for a missing couple who had seemingly just vanished without a trace. And you hear things, and then I remember hearing that they had found the remains and their son was arrested And then, you know, things go quiet and we were on Valo and doing other cases at the time. So it kind of got put on the back burner and I was doing laundry one day. I had all the clean clothes on my bed and I was folding towels and I turned on Line Crime Network and just happened to literally turn the TV on right as the prosecution openings were happening. And I ran into the studio and started watching it and making my notes. So I'm going off of my old trial notes. It's not going to be as detailed as the coverage. You can go back and listen to those full episodes. Fruit Loop was on the podcast with me then. But we're going to hit all the important parts because I've had a lot of people say, please do something on this like you did right before Valo. That's what we're going to do. Chandler, who was 23 at the time, he was charged with first degree intentional homicide, mutilating and hiding a corpse and providing false information on a kidnapped or missing person. His parents, Bart and Krista Halderson, were murdered by Chandler, dismembered. He tried to cremate them in the family fireplace and then eventually scattered their remains in two separate spots. It was a wild ride, and I'm going to go through the prosecution's openings today as well as maybe get into a witness or two, but Bart and Krista Halderson had two sons, Chandler, the one who was charged and convicted of their murder, and also their son, Mitchell. Chandler was still living at home. Mitchell, he was adulting. He got a degree in IT, moved out, and was living with his fiance at the time. These events, by the way, took place from July 1st through July 8th of 2021. On July 1st, between 3 and 5 p.m., Chandler Halderson murdered his parents, Bart and Krista. One week later, on July 7th of 2021, Chandler walks into the sheriff's office to file a missing person report. He told deputies that his parents haven't returned from their family cabin, which was a couple of hours north of where they lived, which is near Madison, Wisconsin. He told investigators that he had helped them pack. He said their cars were at the house, and when asked what he helped pack or the trip, he said bottles of liquor and lots of money tools and silver bars he told detectives his parents left in an unknown car with an unknown couple an unknown amount of money for an unknown reason he said he heard from his mom in a text made it safely can't get anything through and yes is packed going to white lake today for that parade and will be home monday night or tuesday early love you lots Detectives talked to Bart and Krista's co-workers who said they were never no-shows for work. They always would call and say, hey, something's up, or in advance, they would request time off. Investigators start looking into Chandler. Chandler told them that he was a college student about to graduate with an IT degree. He was working from home at an insurance company, and the big news, he had just gotten a job with SpaceX in Titusville, Florida, where he and his girlfriend, Kat, were going to move. They had bought a car and had found a place to live. Also, Chandler had recently been injured, according to Chandler. 
He said he had a head injury and police weren't initially suspicious of him when he came into the police station that day. Initially, police thought maybe Bart and Krista and this mystery couple were in a car accident on the way to the cabin. Chandler's brother Mitchell and his fiance drove over three hours to meet these deputies at this cabin to look around to see if Bart and Krista were there. When they got there, there was no sign that Bart and Krista had been there. The grass was tall. There was no food in the refrigerator. It just looked like nobody had been there in quite a while. So eventually, police start talking to people who were with Chandler that weekend, specifically his girlfriend, Kat, who said she was with him pretty much all weekend, off and on, including at the family farm. He was having leg issues because of his concussion and asked to use their pool the next day at the family farm, saying that it was good therapy for his legs. So police go to talk to the people who own the farm and they confirm he was there on the 4th and the next day he showed up by himself. He was acting a little bizarre. He said he had had a doctor's appointment where he got bad news. He said he was going to lose his job at SpaceX because he couldn't travel to attend the orientation. Then he asks if he could use the pool, and she said yes. So after about an hour, she goes to check on Chandler, and he wasn't there. And she knew he hadn't been in the pool because the cover was still on the pool. She sees his car parked out in the field away from the pool. It was backed in, and the back hatch was up. She thought it was kind of strange, but then she thought, well, maybe he's just on a walk. So she gets in the pool and starts swimming and then sees Chandler walking out of the woods in that same area where his car was. She points out where he came from to investigators, and the investigator looks up in the sky and sees vultures. Police walk 20 yards into the woods and under a pile of debris, they find the torso of Bart Halderson. The legs trigger warning. It's going to get graphic here. And, and this is a big trigger warning for this entire series because it does deal with dismemberment and it's never a pleasant thing to talk about. But the torso, the legs were sawed off in the middle of the thigh. Part of his shorts, his underwear and his belt were still on. I've seen the pictures. It was horrific. When the medical examiner arrived and rolled the torso over, there were gunshot wounds to the back. Investigators put drones in the air, and then they send out their cadaver dogs. A detective sees a garbage can in the woods full of tarp, and both Bart and Krista's blood was all over it. They also spot an oil barrel, or kind of an old fuel tank, right behind where Chandler was parked. An investigator looks inside and sees broken saw blades, hand saws, scissors, tree loppers, and they tested all those items and they were covered with Bart and Krista's flesh and blood. The prosecutor says things were still being found on this farm well after the initial investigation. In October of 2021, the homeowner was cleaning a barn about 100 yards away from where Bart's torso was found and found a rifle behind a bunch of boards inside this barn. Police bring Chandler in and they also ask Kat to come down to answer some questions. Chandler meets with police for over an hour and tells them the story of this mystery couple his parents went to the cabin with. Meanwhile, in another room, Kat is vomiting information to police. He said that she provided pictures and information to them that was helpful in their investigation. She said that she watches true crime stories and knows that they need to rule Chandler out first. That's kind of how it goes. She didn't think he had anything to do with it. Kat meets with police multiple times and tells investigators that one day she left the house early on July 3rd. Now remember, July 1st is the day Bart and Crystal were murdered. She said Chandler told her he was going to do chores, but she opens up her Snapchat and sees that Chandler's in a really weird spot on the map. The reason that they were sharing locations is that Kat had kind of thought maybe Chandler was fooling around on her. So to prove her wrong or to earn her trust, he allowed her to see his location on Snapchat. But because of where he was seemed odd, she actually took a screenshot. It was at 8.58 in the morning. Chandler was supposed to be doing chores, but he was in a forest on the banks of the Wisconsin River. Police recognized the location, and they put drones up in the air in that spot, and they also deployed the cadaver dogs. They found some of his mother Krista's remains. Specifically, it was her legs, one complete leg, a foot, a thigh, 
all in separate locations around the area. When investigators were talking to ex-girlfriends and friends of Chandler, they all said that he actually loved this spot on the Wisconsin River and went there frequently. It was kind of like a little secret swimming hole for him. And a friend showed investigators a picture of Chandler hanging from a tree in the evidence photos they show the jury. You see that same tree. And then about 100 feet away, you see the white crime scene tent in the background. It was very eerie. Chandler had given media interviews on his front lawn about his parents being missing to local media. The only thing is Chandler did not want his face on camera, so there's a lot of audio interviews. He also went to his neighbor's houses asking if they had surveillance cameras. Some of the neighbors were so creeped out by Chandler that they actually secretly recorded conversations. One was a police detective who had just retired a month earlier, by the way. They searched his phone to see what he was doing that weekend, and the phone didn't have much activity but when they searched, they found some things that had been deleted. He had Googled body found Wisconsin, woman's body found, Wisconsin dismembered body found, dead body found in Wisconsin, dead body found in Milwaukee River. Chandler did not know at the time he is searching for this stuff that they had already found the remains. Thank God for stupid criminals, right? You don't get away with nothing these days, y'all. I don't know why people keep thinking they can kill somebody and delete their phone search history. They're going to find out, y'all. Just a spoiler alert. He Googled State versus Peter Kapuza. It's a case where a man who dismembered family members threw their bodies in a river. It actually went to the Court of Appeals on technicalities, and the prosecutor said that was to avoid today, which was the trial. Let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor of the week, Kosas. Summer is here, and when you find yourself wearing less makeup to let your skin breathe easy, but you still want a little coverage, Kosas has you covered, literally. I'm pretty sunburned right now, but I still need under eye concealer that isn't thick and cakes up. Kosas Revealer Concealer isn't your mom's concealer. It's super creamy, weightless, and it's a total multitasker. It's a concealer, eye cream, and spot treatment all in one. Revealer Concealer is packed with active skincare ingredients. It offers creaseless medium coverage and a smooth, radiant finish that looks like your skin, just brighter, more even, and healthier. Take the five-step shade finder quiz to find out your perfect match. Millions of people have tried Kosas, making it one of the best-selling makeup collections at Sephora. Their popular, award-winning Revealer Concealer has over 1,000 five-star reviews. So, don't choose between wearing great makeup and taking care of your skin. Right now, Kosas is offering my listeners 15% off your first purchase of $50 or more when you go to kosas.com slash whattheworld. Go to kosas, K-O-S-A-S dot com slash whattheworld for 15% off your first purchase of $50 or more, plus free shipping. That's kosas.com slash whattheworld him looking up that case in the Court of Appeals. The police initially were thrown off of a text message from Krista that she sent to Chandler on July 4th because it came from her phone. So they start looking into that text message. And actually, they find the parade for White Lake was on July 3rd and not the 4th, like the text message that was supposed to be from Krista said. The reason being is the 4th fell on a Sunday that year. So a lot of places, if it falls on a Sunday, they'll do their celebrations on Saturday. During a search of the home, they found her phone in the garage under a shelf wrapped in aluminum foil in a shoe along with their driver's license. When the phone records were sent to investigators, they found the text was sent from the home, the family home, on July 4th. Chandler sent the text to himself. By the way, the story about him studying renewable resource energy, working at the insurance company from home, and getting hired at SpaceX. He also told people he worked on the Madison Police and Rescue Diving Teams, the head injury, all that stuff, lies. Liabetes, the worst case I've ever seen ever covering trials. Chandler Halderson gets the trophy. Police started looking into all of it, saying he catfished his family. Bart, he was an accountant, and started to question why Chandler never had money, even though he worked at this insurance company. Chandler would make excuses, saying, I'm on salary, but they paid me hourly. 
They held my paycheck until they fixed it. Then he gave them the wrong direct deposit information. Then the other excuse, they owed him so much money when it was deposited, the bank thought it was a scam and fake and rejected it. Chandler had sent emails back and forth to himself pretending to be human resources and would forward those emails to his dad as proof as to why he had no money. The email addresses were generic and the HR guy apparently misspelled resources. Bart was working from home, as Chandler supposedly was. Chandler would get up and sit on his computer all day. He wasn't working. He was playing video games. He liked role-playing games, and he actually formed a friendship and played with a guy in the military who was stationed in Germany at the time. His name is Andrew. They got to be really good friends online playing that game. Andrew testified at the trial and said that Chandler liked SKS rifles. One day, Andrew came to visit Chandler when he was out of the military and stays with him and Bart and Krista at their house. When Andrew got out of the military, he said he's a huge gun enthusiast. And when he came to visit, he brought Chandler one as a gift. When he gave the gun to Chandler, he wanted to document the exchange. So he took a picture of the serial number of the gun next to a photo of Chandler's driver's license side by side. He also left 400 rounds of high powered ammunition. By the way, that was the same gun they found in the barn 100 yards from where they found his father's torso. The friend, not a suspect. He was in Texas at the time of the murders. Kat, the girlfriend, not a suspect. Had no clue what was going on. Chandler's dad was on his case about him not getting paid. So in May into June of 2021, Chandler said he was going to work at SpaceX. He emailed Kat and said he got the job and he was going to train the following week online and report to the job on June 11th of 2021. He told her he got a new car and a place to live for them and she was going to go with him. In late June, when he was supposed to start the fake job at SpaceX, his brother Mitchell gets sick. He's diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and he's hospitalized. Chandler uses that as an excuse to delay the start of his fake SpaceX job. And his brother, of course, is being doted over by the family because he was really, really sick. But he was doing better. He was recovering. So what happens a week later? Chandler ends up in the hospital with a supposed neck injury. They show a picture of Chandler on Father's Day with Bart and Mitchell. And Bart and Mitchell are smiling. And here's Chandler in his neck brace, just looking very stoic. Chandler told people he had a brain bleed, a hematoma, spinal damage. He needed to have his head drilled open, couldn't use his legs, couldn't drive, nerve damage, said he would need a colostomy bag, and he was unable to fly on an airplane. The prosecutors said later in the trial, they would show Chandler was being doted on. People were bringing him meals. His mom would leave little notes of encouragement for him. And they show a picture of Chandler in a neck brace. And then they show a picture of Chandler in a quick trip convenience store just a few days later carrying bags of ice. What did he need ice for? To chill the remains of his father who was in a freezer. He had no neck brace on in the store, by the way. And he's never seen in the neck brace again after July 1st, the day he killed his parents. Chandler had told everyone he attended college and was due to graduate soon. The prosecutor said you will hear he did go there for a semester, but he flunked out. There is a hint of truth to the lies. His parents obviously started to get really suspicious. When investigators searched the house, they found printed emails from Bart on his desk. One of those emails was between Bart and Krista regarding a conversation that Bart had with one of Chandler's advisors. The email says that Chandler was enrolled in fall semester. He was an IT major, and all these things indicated Chandler was a current student. Investigators noticed in the email, Bart said he had talked to this person and noted in the email to Krista, it sounded just like Chandler on the phone. There was also a number he was given to call. The advisor was Chandler, and the phone number was from a burner phone he had purchased which was eventually found in Chandler's room by detectives. There were hundreds of forged emails Chandler had written as if he was an advisor, and Chandler would forward those to his dad to just hold him off. 
They were from Gmail and not a college account. You know, when you get emails from a college, it's like the .edu accounts. But he would often misspell names on emails from the same person. In one email, Chandler acted angry, saying he had been a student for over three years and he wanted a call within 30 minutes from someone. He was pretending to get a transcript, I think. The prosecutor said he was yelling at himself. Police looked at the email again where Bart thought he talked to Chandler's advisor and they saw the name Omar Job. That name was not fake. It stood out because it was real and it was handwritten by Bart. Here's your motive. A day and a half before the murder on June 29th, Bart called MATC and pretended to be Chandler to try and get information on what was going on. So for 17 minutes, Bart talked to Omar Job, who was an entry-level customer service guy at the college. The call was recorded. Omar didn't really remember the call specifically, but Bart questions Omar, and at first he's aggressive, thinking Chandler was actually a student there, questioning why Chandler hadn't graduated and why he can't get a transcript. Towards the end of the call, he asks if any of the people named in those fake emails Chandler had been showing him actually worked there. He was told no. Bart says, that'll be it then, and hangs up. That right there, I think, sealed Bart and Krista's fate. Bart sends a text message to Chandler. It says, I talked to Omar Job. What happened after that is unknown up to the murder. There was something on Bart's work calendar that got detectives scratching their head. On July 1st, the day he was murdered, he was supposed to have a meeting at the college with Chandler and somebody who works at the college. Chandler kind of knew the game was over. Game over, man. He couldn't get out of the lie. July 1st, 7.26 a.m., he messaged Kat, his girlfriend. I hardly slept. Stuff really hasn't been going well for me lately, so I'm trying to plan for the next thing to F me over. Yeah, I just had a great future planned and it's falling apart. I overheard they might go to the cabin with their friends, but I don't know. At 2.10 p.m., at 2.10 p.m., Bart texts Chandler, I'm ready whenever you are. Those are the last words ever recorded of Bart. And he never uses his phone again. And we know Chandler killed his dad. After Bart is shot in the back, Chandler sends a text to his mom. Dad's phone died. Text or call me and get soda on your way home. I have an extra hour of work. She responds, hey, I can and puts a smiley face. Just after 5 p.m., a neighbor's security camera shows Krista pull in the driveway and go into the house. She is never seen again until her legs are found by the river. Just after killing his parents, Chandler went on his phone to the Notes app on his iPhone and created a note at 5.11 p.m. that day just minutes after killing his parents. Weekend chores, H2O2, which is hydrogen peroxide, which cleans up blood. Lemon, which is a deodorizer. Door handles, move your crap upstairs. Get a job, clean the floor. Prosecutors say he spends the afternoon cleaning up the house after the murders, takes a shower, and by the way, FaceTimes his girlfriend while he's in the shower. He goes to gas stations and buys large bags of ice because he dismembered his parents and put them in freezers inside the house. That night, Chandler uses saw blades, an axe, and hand saws to dismember his parents. He planned to burn the remains in the family fireplace on July 1st. Neighbors notice smoke coming out of the fireplace and thought it's odd. It's July. It's hot. Why are they having a fire? One neighbor said it smelled like a pig roast not knowing what it was at the time, and it's near the 4th, so people think maybe somebody's grilling out. That night, a neighbor that lived behind the Haldersons had a security camera. It picked up a glimpse of a window in the house by the fireplace. The light would flicker on and off and grew, and it got really bright in one room. The kitchen light came on, and the lights all went out. What happened was the fire got out of control because of the human fat and Chandler threw water on it. Then, a glass panel on that fireplace was shattered. In a search of the home, the fireplace was cleaned out. What stuck out to police was something that looked like a rock that an anthropologist later determined to be a human skull. He burned his parents' heads in the fireplace. 
Police found facial and knee bones in the ash trap of the fireplace. By the way, they found over 200 pieces of human bone in the ash trap. The next day, July 2nd at 7.21 a.m., he goes to buy a tarp. Kat was supposed to spend the night that evening, and he was asking her to buy peroxide and also to bring a Swiffer mop because he had cut his toe. July 3rd, Kat leaves at 7 a.m., and Chandler leaves shortly after to go to the dump. But... It was closed because it was the weekend of the 4th. So he drove to the Wisconsin River to scatter Krista's remains. He spends the rest of the day with Kat, and they also get dinner with friends. At 11 p.m., cell towers show Chandler along the banks of that Wisconsin River. July 4th, he spends the day with Kat and her family. He goes to the farm, which, by the way, is owned by Kat's mom and her her mom's partner. They have dinner. He asks to come back and use the pool just himself. He sends texts to himself from his mom's phone and goes to a firework party with Krista's co-worker and friend later that night. July 5th, he takes the garbage out, goes up to the farm to use the pool and says he got bad news at his follow-up appointments at the doctor about the concussion. Cell phone and medical records say he never went that day, by the way. He hides Bart's torso in the woods at the farm on the 5th. The excuse needed to use the pool because his fake concussion caused his legs not to work too good, according to Chandler. July 6th, between 1 and 4 a.m., the garage light is turned on seven different times for an average of six minutes each time. The garage is where they found the tools used to dismember his parents. He spends an hour driving around the city of Madison at 4.30 in the morning. That evening... He spends it with his girlfriend, but people are starting to question him about his parents. His girlfriend was most worried. She was very close to Bart and Krista. July 7th, Chandler drives back to the farm and throws a bag of bloody rags in their garbage can. And at 11.22 a.m., he texts Kat. He's going to the police. The rags were in a Target bag that Kat used curbside pickup to get the hydrogen peroxide that he asked for. Her name was actually on the outside of the bag with the bloody rags inside. He goes door to door in his neighborhood asking if they have security cameras. At 4 p.m., he's asked to give a recorded statement to police at their office. At 641, Chandler is arrested. The prosecutors said that investigators took over 5,000 pictures in this case. And he told the jury, you may see 200 and they are terrible. The defense openings were just very short, brief. I don't know how you really defend this evidence that comes out during the course of the trial. They essentially say all the questions that you have will not be answered at the end of this trial. You have to decide if the state proved Chandler killed his parents. They told you what they think happened. He said there's a gap of evidence that comes in with the time frame. And that was really it. There's not much you can do. So from here, what we're going to do is kind of condense the witnesses and their testimony. Some of it's very repetitive amongst different investigators. The next four days, I'm going to bring you the most important facts of the case and sum it up. So that's the end of episode one. Hope you guys have a good rest of your day. We'll see you soon.